Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. So uh, welcome to the uh, annual conference of CR. And uh, I think uh, when we were one year back, uh, no one would ever have imagined uh, such a situation. Uh, last year, we were just before uh, the pandemic started uh, to change our lives fundamentally. And so I'm, I'm very glad now that uh, we could turn into digital mode uh, so quickly at uh, CER so that we can host and organize at least virtually our annual conference. And I'm, I'm very happy to allow this uh, to, to have the possibility here and uh, to welcome more than 500 participants uh, across uh, Europe and maybe uh, further. Uh, and um, also our distinguished uh, speakers, uh, of course, uh, the Commissioner, Ms. Katri Simpson, who will take over in a moment, uh, but also uh, a number of uh, distinguished uh, speakers that will follow and that I will introduce after the, afterwards uh, before each session. Uh, and you have seen already the icebreaker uh, questions, and I invite you, of course, uh, to participate there on the Slido uh, uh, word cloud and answer what has helped you get through the pandemic so far. We will come back to this topic, which I think dominated last, year's, uh, last year, uh, in particular in our first session, which will be chaired uh, by uh, Jean-Laurent uh, Lastel from CRE uh, and uh, highlighting uh, our highlighting our, uh, <clears throat> uh, our report, our interim report uh, on this. Uh, so, uh, on the other side, we also uh, see that uh, the energy system uh, was resilient and stable, and we will, I think, analyze a lot uh, what has helped the energy system uh, get through the pandemic uh, in, in such a functioning way. Last but not least, of course, also because uh, all the uh, players um, uh, cooperated and coordinated their activities, uh, including the NRAs, uh, on the European level as well as on the national level. And I think that uh, has uh, taken, uh, that has had a, a very positive effect, which I think, again, no one would have anticipated, uh, so that it worked uh, out uh, quite, quite smoothly. So we will see a lot of this uh, during our annual conference. Uh, on the dynamic regulation uh, in practice. Uh, so what uh, brought the energy sector uh, through the system and uh, due, due the pandemic and towards energy transition. So we are not only looking backwards, but also looking forward. And I will come back to this uh, at the very end. Um, now, to uh, st um, not to lose any more time, I would like to hand over to our first keynote speaker, the Commissioner, Ms. Katri Simpson. Please, the floor or the camera is yours. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Uh, dear European Energy Regulators, ladies and gentlemen, I am um, very grateful. Uh, for the opportunity to, to speak to, to, to you today and uh, the title of the conference is asking for dynamic solutions and I could not agree more. For over a year now um, our flexibility to adapt uh, has been tested in the most challenging way. Um, the year has uh, given us a snapshot of a renewables dominated energy system. As expected it has uh, lowered the energy prices but it has also um, remained resilient. The crisis has always is an opportunity to trigger change and this includes uh, unprecedented investment opportunities in the recovery phase for um, delivering an ambitious energy transition um, that needs to be guided by an updated regulatory framework. Uh, and I will develop my contribution today um, along these avenues. Um, with the European Green Deal, we have a greater sense of direction and momentum, both translating to a uh, firm set of targets. One decade uh, to reach a 55% reduction in emissions by 2030, and one generation uh, to reach a carbon neutral Europe by 2050. Meanwhile, um, 
this is taking place in the backdrop of the COVID-19 crisis, and while the pandemic might have changed our route, it hasn't changed the destination. We are concentrating our efforts to transform our system and eventually reach that vision of a net zero Europe um, we hope for. Um, our strategy is uh, threefold. First, making uh, savings um, from the very beginning. This is energy efficiency. Then electrifying where we can, especially boosting renewables. And innovating where we cannot electrify, increasing low carbon fuels, for example. Uh, green investment uh, will be our strategy against uh, climate change and green investment can and must drive our recovery from pandemic. The economic crisis um, triggered by the sanitary situation is uh, affecting all sectors, including those uh, that are key to deliver on, on the Green Deal ambition. Um, at the same time, investments in the green transition proved robust in the EU. Last year in the energy sector, some projects on green technologies faced delays, but uh, there was um, no major impact on total investments. Investments in uh, renewable energy capacities in Europe um, were up to 55%, and uh, this was the highest since 2012, according to Bloomberg. In terms of uh, clean energy investment overall, including not only renewable capacity, but also electric vehicles, um, heat pump storage, CCS, Europe accounted for the biggest slice of global investment. It was at uh, $166 billion, up to 67%. Um, and we know that uh, in China, for example, it was down by 12%, and in the United States, down by 11%. So we need to build on this momentum and use a unique opportunity um, offered by the European Recovery Plan and Next Generation EU to ensure a, a green and resilient, a resilient recovery. Altogether, uh, the investment climate for clean energy technologies has arguably uh, even improved, uh, but there are still lessons to be learned from the pandemic and uh, its impacts on the energy systems. Here I want to come to your preliminary analysis published yesterday. Your conclusions have confirmed um, the stock taking we delivered with a staff document on energy security last year in June. The energy sector has uh, proven resilient thanks to outstanding preparedness and um, a fast response to the practical challenges. You have pointed um, to the benefits of digitalization. It has not only facilitated the work, but also remote operations at large. And we will take these opportunities uh, further with the digitalization of Energy Action Plan as announced in the energy system integration strategy. And we have a cybersecurity network code in the making. As regards um, people facing the crisis, we have all followed the situation very carefully. And I'm grateful to the regulators uh, that um, have uh, considered restrictions on disconnections and uh, other measures to mitigate the import impact uh, on consumers. We need a better understanding of energy poverty. And um, US regulators can provide the data and overview, which can help member states um, to design effective policies. We have also set up the new phase uh, of the Energy Poverty Observatory, which now has an extended role to provide support to the national, regional and local actors. Um, in all our initiatives, we have in mind the possible impacts on the cost of energy, notably for those households most vulnerable to price increases. A good example is our approach to energy efficiency. Rebuilding renovation should benefit first the households most at risk of energy poverty. Um, let me now turn to our vision for the future. The Commission has laid out its plan for the energy transition towards the climate uh, neutral continent. We have consolidated uh, the foundations of the um, European Green Deal with a number of initiatives in the energy field. We have launched um, strategies for a better integration of our energy system for hydrogen and for offshore energy, uh, as well as uh, the renovation wave for kickstarting uh, massive efforts for decarbonizing uh, buildings. 
the matching system integration stands out uh, as the blueprint for planning and operating the energy system as a whole across multiple energy carriers, infrastructures and um, consumption sectors. It will create stronger links between them uh, with uh, the objective of delivering low carbon, reliable and resource efficient energy services at the least possible cost for society. A better integration will provide additional flexibility for the overall management of the energy system and thus um, help to integrate increased shares of variable renewable energy production. It will also boost storage technologies, pumped hydropower, grid scale batteries and electrolyzers providing flexibility in the ele electricity sector. By 2050, electric vehicles could provide up to 20% of the flexibility required on a daily basis. Uh, through the closer integration of the power and heat sector, electric heat appliances um, could already make use of uh, real-time electricity prices to smarten demand response. And finally, by linking up the different energy carriers and through localized production, self-production and smart use of uh, distributed energy supply, system integration can also contribute to greater consumer empowerment, improved resilience and security of supply. If last year was the year of strategies and setting the long-term vision, this year is about putting forward the rule book. Uh, we will revise energy legislation to deliver the integrated energy system and achieve a cut in greenhouse gas emissions of at least 55%. In particular, the following proposals will be on the table. First, the Renewable Energy Directive and the Energy Efficiency Directive by June 2021, then Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, and um, that, will, that will be targeted, um, uh, that will deliver targeted revision by the end of 2021. And then a package on competitive decarbonized gas markets, also by the end of 2021. And a new regulation reducing methane emissions in the energy sector, also by the end of 2021. The first two renewable energy and energy efficiency directives will contribute to the Fit for 55 package to follow up uh, on the climate target plan communication together with a range of legislative proposals from climate and energy to transport and taxation. And the gas market initiatives uh, will build on the energy system integration and hydrogen strategies, but also um, the impact assessment for increased climate ambition. Uh, that recognized uh, that um, gaseous fuels uh, will have a role to play in uh, 2030 and also beyond. But we need to put in place an ecosystem for renewable and low carbon gases through uh, regulatory incentives for production and consumption. And we need to address methane emissions along the value chain. Finally, concerning our legislative program, uh, let's not forget the revision of the 10E regulation that was proposed already in December. Uh, it addresses uh, the need for integrated network planning and uh, adds hydrogen projects into the scope. Uh, it will also reinforce current trends of uh, increased electrification, energy system integration, decarbonization of gas, and uh, also digitalization. The 10 year regulation will have to trigger further investments from now to 2030 we estimate that investments in electricity grids need to be double compared to the last decade, reaching more than 50 billion euros uh, per year. Uh, for offshore grids alone, we need more than 530 billion of investments by 2030, excuse me, by 2050. And our hydrogen strategy estimates that investments uh, of around 65 billion euros would be needed by 2030. With this um, broad revision of um, EU energy legis legislation underway, uh, I note well the um, detailed input of energy regulators and the upcoming package of, for competitive and decarbonized gas markets and um, the 10 year regulation. On the former, a public consultation is planned to start in the coming weeks. And of course, we invite all stakeholders to contribute. Um, I will uh, now draw my remarks to, to a close. Um, regulators uh, emphasize um, the importance of energy system integration and the transition at uh, least cost. 
as you have understood from my inter intervention, uh, I can only agree um, with you on this. Investing uh, in future-proof technologies will not only depend on available resources, but uh, on the up-to-date and reliable regulatory frameworks. This requires our continued cooperation on both uh, setting up the rules and implementing them. I uh, wish you an inspiring conference and fruitful discussions through the afternoon. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for outlining uh, so clearly all the projects uh, on its way. And I think we uh, we have a lot uh, to follow up uh, on this. And I also like to thank you very much uh, to highlight uh, the need uh, for a regulatory framework and for the cooperation uh, of, uh, let, um, le of the commission, legislators, and also uh, uh, regulators uh, to implement afterwards uh, the the regulatory framework. I think that is uh, an important uh, part which we should not forget. I also like to join you in the uh, optimism that you showed and to seize uh, the moment that uh, the um, that that we have now uh, to speed up and to change uh, towards a uh, towards a, um, a climate neutral energy system and society as well as economy. With this, uh, I would like to hand over to uh, Vice President uh, Jean Laurent Lastel, who is a commissioner at uh, CRO, and who shared our task force uh, on the impact of COVID-19 on the energy sector. And as uh, Ms. Simpson was saying, we published yesterday an re a first report, uh, and uh, Jean Laurent will highlight uh, the first results that we have uh, seen. Over to you, please, uh, Jean Laurent. Thank you very much, uh, Anne Gret. Thank you very much, President Grobel. Welcome to the first session of this very special day. The session one of our annual conference will look back at the um, once in a lifetime event that has shaken the world in 2020. Obviously, the, the coronavirus pandemic. We will present today a first uh, interim, interim report, as Anne had said, uh, prepared by CR to uh, examine the effects of the pandemic on energy systems in Europe, as well as some lessons learned. Um, we will also hear from several distinguished speakers who will give us the perspective on this major crisis. But let us first start with an online poll for participants. Uh, this is an introduction to our report and it is a way of involving you in our adventure this afternoon so that the video conference does not prevent your direct presence. Uh, in your view, what part of the European energy sector has been most affected by the uh, ongoing COVID-19 pandemic? That is a question. Um, you can uh, say uh, uh, the first possibility is energy supply, A, B, energy demand, C, household energy consumers, D, retail suppliers, E, network operators, F, another component.
Okay, we will uh, we will have soon the results. The technical uh, team tells me that we um, we will have very soon uh, the results, and it will be uh, very interesting um, to uh, uh, to to have the winning category. Uh, e e in my opinion, it will be very varied. Of course, uh, we will check this in the report, which we invite you to read on the CER website. And obviously, everything has been affected, but the answer can be interesting to get an entry point to our problems and to enter the um, the collective uh, imagination. Uh, it will be interesting for that, and it will be very precious to. Uh, to um, to have your uh, participation uh, in a time uh, when since one year uh, we uh, we are very alone uh, in front of our our screens so uh, we can move on um, this provides a perfect introduction to our presentations and roundtable discussion on the effects of the pandemic on energy systems um, I, I will of course briefly uh, as uh, President Grebel said, present CR's interim report. But before, we will have the pleasure to hear from um, Madame Metschild uh, Wersdorfer from the International Energy Agency. Uh, I would indeed now like to give the floor to uh, to, uh, to Madame Metsch, uh, Metschild Wersdorfer to give us a broader insight on how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the clean energy uh, transition. Um, Madame Wersdorfer is the Director for Sustainability, Technology and Outlooks at the uh, International Energy Agency. She plans and coordinates the agency's work on energy sustainability, encompassing clean energy technologies and climate change policy. Um, but she, she has a long experience in clean energy policies, having before held senior management positions in the European Commission, uh, where she worked extensively on the uh, 2030 energy and climate framework and the clean energy package. So it, it will be very precious to have uh, to benefit from uh, their analysis. And I, I'm very pleased, uh, Madame Wasdorfer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jean-Laurent Lastel, and thank you very much, Annegret Gröbel, uh, for inviting me today to speak at your annual conference. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot join in person, as we just heard, and that's also the subject of today's uh, conference. I'm based here in Paris. Uh, it's very sunny outside, and I will give you a bit of a um, presentation on how the COVID-19 pandemic affected the energy system more globally. And I already would like to congratulate uh, the CER for doing that interim report. I, I had a sneak preview and I think it, it, it's, it's really very interesting to see and also draw on the lessons learned. But let me start by giving you this more global overview um next slide please because yeah thank you very much so i mean in summary it has been a big big crisis of the health system as we all know it has impacted the economy but the headline number for the energy system are quite shocking as well we saw globally a drop in energy demand by five percent and these are updated figures from from march but they are spread unevenly uh, across different fuels and technologies. And we also see a larger drop in CO2 emissions because oil and gas and coal was more affected than the low carbon sources. And we see a rather shocking figure, I would say, on the drop in investments, which is minus 18%. You might have seen that, and uh, but to put it in context, that is the biggest uh, shock for the energy system for the last 70 years since, since World War II. 
So the question is now what what happens next? And we had been looking at two significant uh, uncertainties. First, the duration and the severity of the pandemic, how long will it last? And secondly, what could be the response from policymakers? So on the first one, um, we have uh, looked at the pandemic and we always had in mind that the COVID-19 would could leave some long lasting scars on the system. And that's why we de developed at the uh, World Energy Outlook, one of our flagship publications, uh, what we called a delayed recovery scenario, which is a sensitivity case to highlight the downside risks to the energy economy, to energy poverty, and to energy transitions. And I will come back in a second. Then we also looked at the possible policy responses. And there was a backdrop on the strong emphasis on the opportunity to build a cleaner, more secure energy system in the aftermath of the crisis. And we have done in June last year, a really uh, detailed work on sustainable recoveries together with the International Monetary Fund. And we are tracking progress on the sustainable recovery. Let me just already say one clear message, which we did in June last year already to all our governments, which is 30 plus, we need to put clean energy transition at the heart of the recovery. EU is doing relatively well, the members of the EU country uh, of the EU as well, but I will come back in a more broader uh, perspective. Next slide, please. So, Next, click please. The, when we look at this uh, news from the COVID 2020, which I just presented, we looked uh, now uh, more recently, uh, two weeks ago, how it was developed over the year. And we saw uh, a low in April, and then we saw also a rebound strongly, and in some parts of the world, a rising uh, trend above 2019 levels in December. If you can just click for me, click it through, please. So we, you can see the world, China, India, and the United States, and Europe is doing slightly better. better. If we look, why is that? Because the major economy led the resurgence of a pickup in economic activity, and that pushed energy demand higher and significant policies as we had recommended and as I described before, were not pushing the clean energy um, boost and they were now, that's why we see that in some parts and that I find the most striking that the CO2 emissions in December 2020 were above the same at the, the uh, December 2019, and this despite some positive announcement uh, about long-term net zero targets. I see here a stark, a strong um, disregard on one side, the good and positive news on higher targets, net zero pledges, and on the other side, when economy is recovering in some part of the emerging countries or emerging world. Uh, that it's not uh, followed up by global CO2 emissions. So this is a key message for 2021, which is a pivotal year on energy and climate with COP26 and many other events to put again strong focus on clean energy uh, transition and clean energy technologies. Next slide. If we look on what happened uh, in some parts of the world, we has, have seen that, unfortunately, the impact of the crisis felt worst on, on, on the uh, poorest countries. And that has implication on, on energy as well, and first of all, on energy access. Please cl just click through it. Um, because energy access, overall, we have seen progress since 2013, the access uh, has been, uh, people without access had been declining. And some parts of Africa, India did very well, 
some parts of Africa did relatively well, but unfortunately, with the crisis in 2020, the numbers of people who have no access gone up again. And even worse, some who had gained access in that crisis have lost access. So there is a global message on energy access, and you can see uh, the African countries who are most concerned, uh, Nigeria, Congo, Ethiopia, and, and others, which cannot afford basic energy services. Next slide. We have been also looking in our study on the impact, not only on Africa, but also on the oil and gas producers. What has uh, happened to those countries? And we can say that the pandemic has also raised the pressure on the world oil and gas producers. Uh, let me say mainly on the Middle East, which the in income from oil and gas was cut by half in 2020. And for some other producers in the world, the reduction has been even higher. And that had direct consequences on the companies across the industry, which have seen a round of cuts to personal projects were delayed and also spending was lacking. So, and that comes at the time when industry is being asked by investors to clarify the implications of energy transitions for their business models and explain the contribution that these companies can make to the need to reduce emissions. But we wanted to illustrate not only the pressures by looking at production, but at the money to be made from oil and gas companies and how this changes across the different scenarios. Before the crisis, oil and gas companies did relatively well. You can see already on the slide that with the crisis, minus 24 percent um, were down uh, the, the, the money, what they can make from oil and gas. And if we look at our sustainable development scenario, which is Paris Agreement aligned, there will be a further reduction on uh, those countries and producers of oil and gas. And that puts a lot of pressure on the strategies. And I think that is another message that there is an absolutely need for those economy to diversify and really strongly reform their economies. Next slide, please. What does it mean for electricity generation? What does it mean in the future for those? As I said, investment in oil and gas have been falling sharply. But the good news, and we heard it also from the co Commissioner Katri Simpson, and certainly in Europe, in other areas, there has been the investment has been more robust. And thanks to the combination of policy support, technology cost reduction, and also low financing costs, makes investment in renewable power a compelling value proposition. So today, renewables taken together is the second largest source of generation after coal. But in our latest update, we are expecting a landmark shift already by 2025, if you can click once. So by 2025, we see a key role of renewables globally surpassing uh, coal and electricity, and that are multiple sources. Hydropower is still the largest source of renewable power, but we also see a rapid growth elsewhere, basically in wind, onshore and offshore, but also in solar PV. This is even more true for Europe. And let's not forget, as the world relies more and more on electricity, and solar and wind becomes more important and cheaper, the rest of the electricity system cannot still stand still. And I think that will also be one of the lessons learned. We need also to look at grids, and there are a need for major investment in grids, in smart grids, but also uh, in other sources of flexibility to accommodate the rise in wind and solar. Let me go to the next slide. We cannot have a clean energy transition without energy efficiency. We need efficiency and investments in energy efficiency. It's another crucial pillar of rapid clean energy transitions. 
We have seen since 2015 globally improvements in energy efficiency as measured by primary energy intensity, which have been declining. And unfortunately, COVID-19 have added an extra level of stress. As the result of crisis and continuing low energy prices, energy intensity is expected to improve by only 0.8 percent in 2020, which is roughly the half the rates corrected by weather for 2019 and 2018. This is definitely well below the energy efficiency improvements we need for clean energy transitions and be in line with the Paris Agreement. Let me go to my last slide. We have been looking at the CO2 emissions trend. And I think, as I mentioned in, uh, in the beginning, we have seen 2020 globally a decrease in 6% in 2020. And by the way, in Europe, it has been roughly the same 4 5%. But this basically is for the wrong reasons. What we need is definitely a structural change. If you look at our stated policy, which is the blue line and which is the baseline, we made a detailed assessment in that scenario of actual policy announced or planned in various sectors and countries. And in that scenario, CO2 emissions rebound to 2019 levels in a few years time and remain roughly at that level. This is definitely not in line with the Paris Agreement and would lead to a temperature increase of around 3%, uh, 3 degrees. When we look at the delayed recovery, as I said, this unfortunately is becoming a more likely scenarios that emissions are lower, but reductions come at a huge economic and social cost. A weaker economy also drains momentum from the process of change in the energy sector. A slump can suppress emissions, but not solve the climate problems. And then we need to look at the sustainable development scenario, which is Paris Agreement aligned, and which would lead to clean energy investment that brings us into a different pathway. Let me conclude. The IEA has done this covered report and what I presented right now is an updated uh, based on the latest figures we got for 2020. There's a strong, strong message to look at the recovery EU uh, next generation and all the stimulus package to put clean energy technology at the forefront. We are organizing tomorrow for those interested an IEA COP26 summit on net zero, uh, which is live streamed at 12 o'clock Paris time. And we are working in my team, the different modelers on a global net zero roadmap 2050, which will be, which will be launched in mid-May, 18th of May, um, to show what is really needed globally we look at all the different pledges, but also on the sectors and the technologies and make policy recommendation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm very much looking forward also to the next presentation on the interim report done by CER. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madame Oberdorfer. Thank you so much. It was so precious for us uh, to 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 have to benefit from this analysis, these numbers, these graphs. I propose that um, the questions uh, will uh, will be um, expressed uh, after the presentation, maybe during the roundtable, uh, because uh, of course time flies and it will be really the moment of uh, uh, of a very rich and dense uh, discussion. Um, I, I want to to say to you that the technical team tells me that we have the poll results from the uh, introduction. So I give the, the results. Uh, the question was, what part of the European energy sector has been most affected by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic? And the 59% um, uh, of you uh, answered energy demand, energy demand, 18% uh, household energy, 
12% retail, 6% network operators, 4% energy supply consumer suppliers, um, and that's uh, that's it. So of course, uh, and uh, it was uh, absolutely uh, logical. Uh, energy demand is a uh, 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 big uh, answer, of course. So thank you very much. Uh, we can maybe uh, now talk about uh, the report. Um, with this interim with this interim report, we have uh, attempted to provide a first snapshot of the impact of the pandemic on the energy sector in CR uh, countries uh, to uh, give you a, a little bit of background. Uh, I, I don't know if you see the, the slide. Uh, yes, we uh, can see the slide. OK, perfect. Because. Uh, 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 to give you a little bit of background, in June last year, CR set up an ad hoc working group on the COVID-19 pandemic. It is a request from our president, Anne-Gret Grebel, whom I thank and who I hope is happy with her work. I hope it's a need, of course, expressed by the members of the CR uh, General Assembly who want to have a European vision of what affects us. It was an exercise that uh, changed in uh, principle. At the beginning, I admit, we believed um, after the first wave that the situation would improve and that we could reflect with serenity, with globality on the medium and long term effects um, of the health crisis. We were therefore very happy to have this cross-sectional working group, which was able to take a broad view. The reality of the second wave, and then the prospect of the third, um, forced us to realize that the crisis was not over and that governments um, caught up in the short term uh, crisis uh, needed us. And it is a great challenge for this gr working group to look at both the short term and the, and the long term to understand the reality and the scale of what we are experiencing. Um, the working group is a dedicated forum for regulators with two objectives, to exchange experiences with regard to be to, uh, with regard to the pandemic's effects on the electricity and gas sectors, of course, and to identify um, a first set of lessons learned and best practices. Uh, the interim report that we present to you today is essentially based on the replies of 28 national regulators that were gathered at the end of 2020, with updated news, of course. Uh, we also uh, compared the data received with the findings from other institutions, notably the International Energy Agency, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the European Commission, of course, we, we worked uh, uh, closely. Um, and ACERs, of course, uh, and uh, CR's market monitoring reports. I would like to stress that, of course, this is not yet an in-depth analysis of all causes and effects that came to play in this pandemic. Rather, it is a first attempt to get together and share experiences that uh, national regulators um, uh, have found uh, not worthy. Uh, so, let me talk about the impact on the electricity and gas uh, system. Uh, if we look first at the effects of the crisis on energy markets, and in particular electricity, uh, we note that in spring 2020, at a time when um, several countries in Europe imposed restrictions on businesses and citizens, notably lockdowns, many national regulators reported significant um, uh, drops in electricity demand and electricity prices. 
in the table we have compiled the data provided by several national regulators for the respective countries. You can see that global electricity consumption per month between March and June 2020 was several percentage points below the corresponding consumption figure in 2019. Uh, of course, global electricity consumption, all types of, of, of consumption, households and business consumers taken together. Now, for most countries, the drop in consumption given in the table was not only attributable to the pandemic restrictions, but also to other causes. At the time of writing, only uh, our colleagues from eControl in Australia, in Austria were able to calculate the pure COVID-19 effects. That's to say the demand drop attributable to the pandemic, which is indicating uh, in the table, but maybe we, we will can discuss uh, during the discussion. Um, for slide uh, 15, regarding electricity, other facts were notable. First, with a fall in electricity demand, several countries saw a mechanical increase of the share of renewable energy sources in the electricity mix. Second, and even though this period was not yet fully covered by, by our data collection exercise, it would seem that the second wave restrictions in the fourth quarter of 2020 had less of an impact on energy demand and prices. Um, uh, but uh, Madame Wasdorfer talked about this uh, problem. Um, on uh, slide 16 for gas, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic was less clear. Prices had already been low before and weather conditions probably played a greater role in the consumption trends seen in various countries. Um, for slide uh, 17, in our report, we put a focus on measures taken to help consumers. Due to business closures, income losses, and sometimes job losses in many countries, unfortunately, there was a risk that consumers could not pay their energy bills anymore. Uh, by the way, uh, we, we, we had to deal with new precariousness, which is not always the focus of our concerns as regulators. Energy transition, performance, robustness of energy networks, security of supply were mostly our missions, but we also have today the duty to relieve, to try to relieve consumers sometimes confronted with the impossibility of heating, of having access to the energy without which there, there is no normal life possible. There is an incredible challenge for us in our dialogues with governments, but also with consumer associations and local authorities. It forces us to get out of our centralized tables, to listen to the country, to, 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 to listen to the difficulties of people here and now, not tomorrow, of the population. Therefore, the most prevalent measure was to protect consumers from disconnection. 18 national regulators reported some form of disconnection ban, either ordered by state, state authorities or even granted voluntarily by energy suppliers. Another measure that was, for instance, implemented in France was to allow consumers to stagger or postpone, defer the payment of the energy bills. There also were other measures, most of which were not related specifically to energy bills or energy consumption, but open to all citizens and sectors. You know that several countries implemented short-time work, partial unemployment or furlough schemes. But in some countries, there were additional measures for consumers with an energy focus, for instance, target aid to cover energy costs, such as fuel vouchers, or measures to facilitate the access to social tariffs. 
some countries also allowed businesses to temporarily suspend or reduce the capacity of the energy supply contract. Uh, for slide 18, we also took a first snapshot of the effects of energy suppliers and network operators. For energy suppliers, the mirror image of disconnection bans in favor of energy consumers was that several national regulators reported or expect, expected an increase in unpaid energy bills and as a consequence, suppliers reported an increase in losses. Therefore, in some countries, energy suppliers were allowed to stagger, defer the payment of the network tariffs bills. Network operators were mostly um, uh, were uh, mostly impacted by lockdown measures insofar as they had to discontinue the normal operation and focus on in essential activities only. As a consequence, several new regulators reported some delays in network development and the rollout of smart meters. Um, but so far, only a few regulators have already taken measures in favor of the network operators, such as, for instance, easing some obligations and penalties with regard to the quality of service or taking into account some pandemic related costs, for instance, for personal protective equipment. In fact, many regulators are expected to take a full review of the impact of the network operators in 2021. And for slide 19, most importantly, we had some interesting replies from national regulators on the first set of lessons learned and best practices. Overall, uh, regulators noted that the, the electricity and gas sectors have proven resilient as um, uh, uh, Madam Commissioner said, the system has kept working. And this is not a small observation. We can say it, we can be happy about it, we can be confident in our collective capacity to build a strong regulated European energy model as a service of our citizens. In a few, few countries that involved taking some precautions. For instance, in Ireland, some generation units were set aside early in the year to guarantee that they would be available through the winter peaks later. Several regulators also, also stressed the importance of a good flow of information between the government, the regulators and energy companies. To name just one example among many, the Finnish regulator flagged a good experience with a centralized task force involving all relevant parties which helped identify and solve problems as they occurred. Several countries uh, adapted the procedures and made changes to obligations and deadlines so as to provide the operators with legal certainty. In Germany, the parliament swiftly adopted a law allowing for changes in deadlines and enabling digital solution in procedures. And Without surprise, one of the most important measures was the one to protect energy consumers from disconnection uh, in yeah. case they had problems paying their bills. Uh, and in some countries, such as Italy, the extra burden temporarily taken on by energy suppliers was partially alleviated by ad hoc financing uh, to cover losses. Um, and finally, several regulators also said that digitalization and tools to operate systems remotely made progress and gained more acceptance. Uh, generalized teleworking was reported by many regulators as a positive experience, and some regulators also note, such as our friend in Luxembourg, that many stockholders had made a virtue of necessity by pushing ahead with digitalization. As I said before, to conclude, this interim report is only a first snapshot. We do not have all the data yet. We may not even have seen all consequences yet of the crisis. This is obviously a report that will have to be updated as the work uh, of the CER working group continues anyway. I invite you, of course, to go and see the report since we can only quote a few extracts from it today, but it is a report that counts more than these few words, of course. But with a report which gathers the first set, set of experiences and lessons from 2020, we hope to contribute to the discussion on how to overcome this crisis. And, uh, 
uh, it was um, incredible uh, work. Thank you uh, to all and thank you very much for your attention. Um, I know you have questions, of course. Uh, it's, a, a, it's a human right. <laughs> and uh, uh, I uh, propose um, that the question will be uh, discussed uh, during the, the round table because uh, we have, of course, uh, always a problem of time but i, I promise uh, it uh, the questions will uh, enrich the incredible next uh, round table so um i propose it's time for this round table we have some very valuable brilliant informed guests who will enrich our imaginations and ideas i would like to introduce our three panelists who will give us more in-depth perspective on the effects on the COVID-19 pandemic. First, let me introduce Professor uh, Yirzi Yaromir Klemesh. Professor Klemesh is the head of the Sustainable Process Integration Laboratory at the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering at Brno, University of Technology in um, Czech Republic. Professor Klemesh, having researched and published extensively on clean and sustainable technology and will give us his view uh, on the energy transition opportunities that come with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Second, I would like to welcome Mr. Matthew Vickers. Uh, Mr. Vickers is the chief executive and chief Ombudsman of Ombudsman Services, the uh, British Energy and Telecommunication Ombudsman is he is he is also Vice President of the National Energy Ombudsman Network. Mr. Vickers will provide us with more insight on the consequences of the pandemic for energy consumers. Key uh, question. And uh, Madame Marie-Pierre Fauconnier joins us from uh, Cibelga, the, the well-known uh, distribution network operator for electricity and gas in the Brussels capital region in Belgium. Uh, and uh, Madame Fauconnier is also a real friend of CR uh, since she has previously been uh, the chairwoman of the board of directors of the Belgian uh, national regulator Craig and since she was also vice president of CR. Um, Marie-Pierre, uh, uh, welcome back. So we start maybe with Professor Klemesh. The floor is yours. OK, uh, <clears throat> I hope you can hear me well. Uh, very well, very I well. Am, yes. uh, I am uh, one of you from the academia. So uh, it's uh, uh, quite an honor to be in the group of ombudsman uh, uh, commissioners, uh, uh, regulators and so on. But on the other hand, because it's a panel discussion, it should be a little bit lively. And uh, academia is in a way uh, more free to uh, search in the future. And uh, what is my most important issue is uh, uh, we shouldn't repeat uh, the usual mistake. You know, uh, what is a usual mistake uh, in the military? That the uh, chief of staff and generals are preparing for the previous war. And uh, I am trying to find uh, with my quarter, as you can see, uh, the commission is uh, very much concerned about gender gender issues and uh, all my group and all my presentations are well balanced and uh, uh, Dr. Fan contributed quite a lot to the paper. I am going to show you uh, just the conclusions in two slides. So please the next slide. And uh, this is what we recently published. Uh, and uh, it's the picture about waves of innovation. It's an interesting observation. And uh, we came actually to the social sciences, which uh, uh, originated well uh, about uh, not only in the previous century, but uh, previous but one. And uh, every crisis is actually initiating a new wave of innovation. And you can see the uh, the timing, uh, the wars, the big crisis in the 30s, always uh, 
it come with something new. But to get something new, it needs uh, what social sciences are uh, terming as creative destruction. For example, when uh, we developed a lot about the steam power, about uh, uh, 1845 to 1900, it was uh, more or less destroyed by income of coal and especially electricity. After coal came oil and gas. And uh, at the present situation, which we've got quite a big uh, crisis, what is happening? It's enormously chance for making big step for renewable energy. And uh, we also have got a big step, not only for consuming energy, but the way how to consume energy. Please, uh, uh, for the next slide. And uh, this is uh, just condensed uh, outcome from uh, uh, our recent research. We should jump on new opportunities and emerging development. And uh, those four things are not all, but just some of them which we considered uh, the most important. Uh, spread of distance meeting and learning. Our conference today is a uh, very good example. And uh, uh, on one side, we don't need to travel, but on the other side, we are consuming uh, energy and mainly electricity. And when we went into details, such a meeting like this is not uh, uh, energy free and it's not emission free because it depends uh, what is the origin of uh, the uh, electricity which we are using. And it depends in different countries. We've got massive home office. I have to admit, uh, I've been working with my research group uh, from home now for 10 months. And it's a long time. And some people are saying it's very bad, the people are suffering. But uh, our opinion is slightly different. If uh, the home office and the research is well organized, well using uh, distant meeting, learning, teleconferencing, and uh, all the media. Our research results are actually for last uh, 10 months much better than normal. Why? Well, because we are not losing time by traveling to the office. And in, uh, fortunately, we are not living in a huge city. But uh, I spend most of my uh, professional time in Manchester at uh, UMIST, University of Manchester in Social Science and Technology. And uh, I spend every day three to four hours, hours commuting. And uh, now, with these new opportunities, we don't need to do it. Uh, of course, I am an older generation and I prepare, prefer to meet. Uh, uh, face to face. But when I look on my grandchildren, for them, uh, web meetings, uh, social media are actually more preferred, too much preferred than uh, meeting face to face. Uh, e shopping. E shopping uh, make enormous boost. Some uh, retailers are crying and demanding from the government some compensation, but each crisis is good for able. And e-shopping companies made enormous boosts. But again, from the point of energy, is it good or bad? Well, we need to uh, make a good balance observation. It can be from the point of energy beneficial, but uh, in some cases we can actually spend more energy than uh, going to the supermarket. Race in e-socializing, again the same. Uh, we've got uh, new enormous demand for data transmission. And uh, uh, of course it's 5G, but uh, even now starts demand for 6G. And this crisis is enormously facilitating those uh, options. On the other hand, from the point of energy, 5G 
is consuming a lot of energy. In the paper I mentioned, we, we made some calculation and showed some graphs. So it's a no free lunch. 5G and 6G is going to demand a lot of energy. And uh, what energy? Electricity. Urban and sanitary reforms. Again, it is uh, uh, facilitated by COVID, waste management, but also a new movements to so-called 15 minutes smart cities uh, to design and uh, develop new cities which are not requiring like me in Manchester to traveling uh, 21 miles each way every day and uh, spend a lot of time but having uh, the most uh, facilities within 15 minutes walk or bike. This is not so easy but uh, Again, it can get very, very important uh, impact on energy to make uh, self-sufficient, uh, uh, sustainable micro -riots. In this case, uh, it is uh, uh, very good for future development. Uh, remote and robotic health monitoring. Probably you uh, uh, experienced something similar in the time of uh, COVID pandemic, uh, it's uh, not uh, very very um, encouraging to uh, meet your GP and to to get in the waiting room with another 10 people and by statistics uh, of out of 10, two or three are COVID-19 infected. And a lot can be done by uh, uh, e-health. I think many of us have got uh, smart watches. You can check your pulse, you can check your blood pressure, you can check your exercising, you can check your sleep, and uh, you can get uh, uh, results and you can transfer it to your GP and get uh, advice. So, and uh, I don't want to talk too much. There are some other points which you can read and uh, which you can make uh, the conclusions. So what uh, we should do? I think we shouldn't uh, look too much in the past. Okay, statistics, what happened, uh, how much uh, uh, energy was uh, uh, reduced, uh, how much lost uh, emission dropped. We should look in the future because after each crisis comes uh, recovery and uh, even when uh, this COVID pandemic is much longer than we expected, because a year ago we assumed that in September, October, everything will be as normal. But now if you look on VHO statistics, the vaccination started to show the light at the end of the tunnel. And we have to be ready, and we have to be ready for a renewable, sustainable future. And... Uh, uh, this is all based on Internet of Things, on uh, e-meeting, e-shopping, e-medicals, uh, everything. But all this requires energy. And uh, by data transaction, a lot of energy is needed and is wasted. There are some interesting uh, applications when huge uh, data hubs were providing heating of uh, uh, number of houses around and so on. So let's discuss these options. Let's discuss the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Klemer. Thank you for this very stimulating presentation. We, um, I, I give the floor uh, now uh, to uh, Matthew Vickers. Uh, welcome, Mr. Vickers. Hello. Hi, uh, listener. I've got um, three points that I wanted to talk about today. I think I'm starting from the micro end because our work as ombudsman is obviously we deal with uh, thousands of people, thousands of individual consumers who are making complaints who are, who are coming to us with issues. So this, it, the three reflections, three broad reflections that I've got are very much based on that. And they're around the theme of dynamism. So when we talk about dynamic, I'm going to talk about three things. One, about the impact of speed and change, because we've seen a lot of that in the last year, as we've already heard. 
to the questions about connection and opportunity. Um, I think there's some really interesting developments in terms of narratives and consumer trust that's that's important going through this. And then the third one is something of a challenge around regulators and agility um, around what's had to change through the pandemic. So uh, taking the three of them, look, the, the first one is I don't think we could have ever imagined anything that would challenge both consumer industry and regulatory resilience quite the same way that this has over the last year. Um, and the speed and volatility of change has been uh, unprecedented, almost unimaginable. What's that meant? Well, first of all, we've seen some things uh, earlier on about the impact on consumers, but I think we've seen the rise of, as regulators, um, everyone's been grappling with this concept of vulnerability for a while. What does a, a vulnerable consumer, a vulnerable citizen look like and how might we deal with that? I think the pandemic just turned that on its head. There's whole groups of society who we'd never thought of as being vulnerable before, who we'd never thought of protecting before, who very, very quickly through shutdowns and economic crash and so on, found themselves in a position of vulnerability, a position they'd never been in before. So a new vulnerability, new consumers, new citizens dealing with these challenges for the first time. I think along with that, um, the other point about speed and volatility was the way that this has affected all regulated sectors at once. If you're a consumer, everything that you do from financial services to communications to water to energy, all affected at once. So you're facing multiple risks in multiple dimensions at the same time with shrinking resources. And I think the other thing that that's impacted on is, is industry's ability to absorb some of those challenges. I mean, we heard earlier in Jean Laurent's presentation about some of the, the pressures that have been on suppliers, that ability to bridge that ability to absorb um, some of the questions of affordability has re really kind of thrown into sharp relief some of these questions about social policy, fuel poverty, ability to pay. So that's the first broad point I'd make about the speed and volatility of change. This really is a moment of crisis, as the professor was talking about before. The second point to come on to is opportunity. So we're all very aware that this happened already as we're embarking on in many ways, an even more difficult challenge, which is that one about um, net zero, how in the UK's case, how we get to net zero by 2050, but wherever we are, whichever country we are in the world, dealing with that net zero challenge. I think what COVID-19 has shown us is the importance of trust in taking consumers and taking citizens with us on that journey whether that's in a negative way through lockdowns about you know what happened when we took consumers into lockdowns and um, took things away or whether we're talking about now vaccines vaccines should be something positive that we're talking about giving consumers something back and yet that rollout and that take up hasn't always been clear so for me that says there's some really important things for us to think about in the context of as we're taking the energy sector from a world of commodities into a world of services, into a world of um, dynamic demand, into that world of the Internet of Things, there's going to be a need to develop and build on consumer trust as one of the key assets, as one of the key things that will get us to net zero quicker, more efficiently, more fairly. But that, that raises some really important questions about the narratives that we build and the trust that we build. Um, that's going to be interesting given that the reason why we're here is energy of course is a regulated sector and energy traditionally has not been one of the sectors of the market that consumers and citizens trust. That brings me on to my third point which is about regulatory agility. Look I think we've seen this to a greater or lesser extent across Europe but particularly speaking from a UK perspective I was very impressed with the way that Ofgem responded as our regulator. But why? Well, actually, in many ways, because they did the precise opposite of what regulators have been doing for decades. Again, as the professor talked about these paradigm shifts, these moments of change about how we make sure we don't fight the last war. What we saw was the regulator taking away a lot of activities, reducing a lot of things, consultations, changes and so on setting out much more clearly a route map that was around principles around what outcomes do we want um, 
and around building partnerships, working much more in conjunction with industry and setting out a couple of broad things that say, look, this is what's most important, but otherwise just leaving it to people to get on with it, letting suppliers, letting companies find their own way to do the right thing within a clear set of parameters. So for me, I think that's a really important reflection about what dynamic regulation looks like, that when we think that at the point when the risk was the highest, when complexity in the market was the highest, when the impact on consumers and citizens was the highest, it's exactly the point where the best response was to reduce control rather than regulate more and try and add more control. It just makes you wonder if we did that at a point of stress, why don't we do that all the time? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Vickers, Matthew. Thank you so much for this uh, very, very uh, interesting presentation. And I give the floor to uh, Marie-Pierre Fauconnier uh, for the for the last intervention uh, in this roundtable. Yes, um, thank you very much for the, the invitation. And I'm very, very happy to, 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 to see you again, my previous colleagues. Well, I'm not going to be very long. Next slide, uh, please, uh, or regarding uh, Sibelga, just to draw your attention on some key figure and data. Uh, Sibelga is uh, the DSO for the distribution of gas and electricity, but also the public lighting in Brussels. You can see on the slide too uh, all the, the key figures for uh, these uh, companies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, well, uh, I'm sorry, but this slide is not um, up to date anymore because, to be honest, we are facing for the moment a third wave. Um, I just want Next slide, please. Um, I just want to speak about what we have done during the first and the second wave and what we are facing now. Um, first of all, to be honest with you, we were not prepared uh, to manage and to drive this kind of crisis. But I think that no one were um, prepared to, to, to manage this kind of uh, pandemic. The first thing is I would like to say today is just a big thank to my uh, Italian colleagues from the north of the country, from a DSO, uh, because you know that Italy uh, was early mover in this uh, pandemic three weeks before Belgium. And I had several calls with him and he provided me some advice and some uh, um, tools and some, uh, um, well, uh, information regarding how they uh, drive the activities during the beginning of this crisis. Thank you, thank you very much for this kind of cooperation. Regarding the phasing uh, of the activities um, in, uh, in Belgium in, and specifically in Brussels, uh, just to say that we continue during all this pandemic uh, to manage what we call the essential uh, services. And what is that is the dispatching, the on-call services for emergency, we never interrupt that. A second point is the fact that in one day, we move 100% of the administrative staff to the remote uh, work. In one day, it's, uh, well, it's, it was really challenging. Regarding the non-urgent activities, we resume uh, these activities from uh, the 15th April, and in May, we were back to the normal activities at 100%. The element that I would like to say is the fact that, well, in March, it was extremely difficult because we were not prepared and we have to learn day per day regarding the evolution of the pandemic. But the period in which we were the big stress is definitely during the second wave and specifically in November, regarding the high level of contamination in the company for the people who has to uh, ensure the essential services. And we were already in stresses in November uh, regarding the continuity of the company. Regarding, next slide please, the lesson learned. 
I'm extremely proud of my company and my staff on their commitment just to ensure these essential services. You know what does it mean? It means that no one has decided to stay at home um, because you know what is essential activities is just to enter in houses where there is contamination. And no one asked to stay at home. They were really committed to ensure these essential services. Second thing is regarding the governance. We have decided early in the process to create what we call a crisis steering committee dedicated definitely to, to drive and to manage this crisis. Third point is the fact that I have to say that we have, we had, and we continue still now to have a very good cooperation with the labor union. Really, they show a very high quality and level of maturity to drive this kind of crisis. The four, fourth point is something quite new for me, is the fact that every day at 11 o'clock in the morning, I had a call with my colleague CEO from the other C, uh, DSO just to exchange about the solution, just to exchange about the problem that we have to face with. And it was extremely useful because, you know, when we are on the top of a company, everyone is looking at you. And this kind of exchange was really, um, well, secure for me. And that created a structural cooperation among the DSO in Belgium. And the last thing is the fact that, well, we use what you can use in this case, Atranet, Ecofi, virtual yoga, stretching classes, to keep in touch with all the people of uh, all the collaborators of Sibelga. Alors, the last thing that I want to say today is, unfortunately, we have to face with a third wave. And to be honest, the people are really tired of being at home or working with uh, such protocol, for example, to wear a mask and so on. And this pandemic is extremely long and extremely difficult to keep the people committed and motivated to stay on job. And this is now the challenge we have to face with. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Marie-Pierre. Thank you so much for this very alive and uh, stimulating presentation. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, it's uh, well, we are uh, late, but uh, we can um, we can of course uh, ask some questions. Uh, maybe one questions I um, I am reading in the chat. Um, maybe this question for Mr. Vickers. Mr. Vickers, uh, are you with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I I am reading a, a question from the chat. Some people have lived rather well during this crisis, teleworking from home, and others have it harder, being frontline workers and struggling to pay the bills. Um, Mr. Vickers, how do we approach this new schism, this new separation? Um. I suppose I'm not sure how much of it is. It, it's probably exaggerated or deepened some things that that were maybe already there. Um, if, if the question is about, you know, just transition and how do we make sure that um, that the transition to a new energy market is fair? I, I do think that the um, I'm probably going to throw up more questions than answers, but I do think that this this throws up some other areas for us to think about. Um, some of them being, look, in a world where what it brings home is that there are very different lifestyles that people have, and not everybody in, is in a position to protect themselves in the energy market the same way. And that's not just about um, financial questions. I think as the, as the questioner points out, there's some questions about lifestyle. And I think these questions about lifestyle become really important in a market that, as we know, is going to have to depend much more on flexibility, on flexibility of demand. It's wonderful in an economic model to say, well, we'll just send price signals. We'll reward consumers for their flexibility because that sounds great, doesn't it? And that way, everyone will be much more flexible. I think what um, the, the question brings out really well is, look, some people just can't do that. We have to recognize that the overlap between um, 
flexibility and the demand and ability to pay, it's going to throw up all sorts of new questions for us um, that say, look, we can't just have a simple kind of, you know, econometric model that says, right, reward people for, you know, this, this bright new future of digital and tech and, and flexible demand. And that's the reason why, you know, the second area I was focused on was trust. Unless we can show people where the benefits are for everyone in this, much in the same way as we had to through vaccines and lockdowns, we, we can't expect that people will buy into this, that we'll get that compliance, if you like, that buy-in to whatever the, the next paradigm looks like. Thank you very much, Mathieu, for this very precise answer. Yeah, uh, Maybe uh, I, uh, yes? If, if two, two, two sentences. Uh, yeah, you course. know, every crisis and every change is painful. But uh, uh, if we look through laws of Darwin, uh, every crisis, every development is actually improving the population. And in our case, it should be improving the market as well, because there are new opportunities. And uh, I know Ombudsman is for protecting people, but uh, too much uh, protection in the, the nature is not good. So we should always get a reasonable balance of protection and uh, providing opportunities for the fitness, fitness companies, fitness customers. I think that's true. The point I would make on that, though, is unlike Galapagos turtles, consumers aren't so resilient. They live for 300 years. Yes, um, it's very, uh, uh, very eternal uh, debate, but very uh, current. Uh, I see a potential question for Marie-Pierre. Uh, Marie-Pierre, maybe uh, is it's. Um, I am reading the question. We see that with COVID, a lot more people have been teleworking, mm -hmm. sometimes far away from the office. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see the new normal for yeah. energy distribution post COVID? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you for the question. <laughs> Well, we are still uh, manage this uh, third wave, and uh, probably it's a little bit too early to discuss this uh, this kind of uh, of issue. But uh, definitely, well, uh, regarding the um, the collaborator, we know that we will not come back on the the situation before the COVID, because well, regarding the the remote uh, work. We were with one day per week, and now we are under five day per week um, uh, at home. Then, regarding the situation in the DSO, that will change definitely uh, the, 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 the way we work uh, in the company. Regarding the role of the DSO, we know that um, we prove, if I can say in this world, the fact that. Uh, the DSO are really useful to support the economy, to support the life of the people, specifically when the people work at uh, the houses. We need this kind of company who ensure the distribution of electricity and gas, specifically when there is this kind of crisis. You know, the DSO, uh, it's a part of the, the, all the channel in the energy distribution, in the energy uh, field. And sometimes the people has no idea about the rule of the DSO. And I think that with this pandemic crisis, we prove how our job is essential for the economic lives, but also the, the, the life of everyone. Then, as you said just uh, before, well, the pandemic is really um, something very difficult to, to live with, but they also, there is also opportunity to prove our, our job is essential for the people. Absolutely, you're right, and it's very good to highlight it. Um, uh, I can see maybe a last question um, for um, uh, maybe to uh, Mr. Uh, Klemesh, Professor. Uh, you mentioned 
5G and 6J, how can we combine increasing digitalization with the climate change mitigation objectives and 5G data centers, massive energy data? It's a good question. I don't know if uh, Professor Klemesh is with us. Sorry, sorry, I forgot to switch ah, yes. off. Uh, I hear. Yeah, it's uh, not uh, not answer for two minutes, but yes. uh, 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 what is the fact we can't stop the development and the development is accelerating and the amount of data which are needed actually for uh, smart houses, smart cities is enormous. And in this case, uh, uh, we uh, now we are saying 5G is great. Some people are saying 5G caused COVID. Uh, well, uh, no comment about this. If if you look through Facebook, you can see a lot of things like this. And uh, there are even some people who are destroying uh, 5G equipment, saying it's uh, enormously dangerous for health. Uh, well, it would happen always, but uh, uh, it is the fact. And uh, uh, what uh, I am a little bit unhappy that uh, my home country is a little bit light in 5G, because the future, future development is in development of uh, communication and data transmissions. So uh, this is uh, what is going to happen. And uh, with the uh, energy, Yes, it will be more and more energy needed. And uh, I've, I've got some studies, for example, showing that uh, artificial intelligence, which can uh, uh, be seen as a uh, big energy saving, actually consumes a lot because the human brain is enormously, is enormously uh, efficient. And to replace the human brain and uh, train artificial intelligence, it requires megawatts, megawatt hours of energy. So if we are moving there, uh, we have to be very, very careful how much energy we would need. Uh, <clears throat> when I've seen uh, this ABCD questions, what is the most important? Uh, I definitely think it's efficiency because the cleanest and uh, so-called greenest energy is energy not used, energy saved. Uh, and uh, uh, even the renewables, you know, the, uh, renewables are very nice, but what we should do is to minimize environmental footprints. And in some cases, it can be renewable energy. In some cases, it can be even not uh, always renewable energy. And uh, with the efficiency is what uh, the question was about. We need to try in circular economy also to circle the energy. Uh, this is uh, using the waste heat. Waste heat is uh, enormous. And uh, if we reduce the waste heat or reuse better, this would be a great improvement and a probably better improvement that uh, invest in uh, some uh, brand new uh, ways of uh, generating energy. And uh, uh, regarding the lockdown, actually uh, the best uh, suited are people who are living sustainable life. If you've got your house, which has got a photovoltaics on, on the roof, which has got a wind turbine and which has got a storage, you can even in a case of a deep crisis, you can still still live your more or less normal life. So and this is this is what I mentioned about this 15 minute cities. It's not about minimizing transport, but also made it uh, self sufficient because transferring, uh, you know it much better, transferring uh, gigawatts of uh, power of electricity. Uh, the big losses. Mm -hmm. And at the moment we are transferring uh, electricity from Poland to Italy and it's not for free. So uh, I see the future in sustainable communities 
when, of course, the trade and exchange should be done, but uh, reasonably minimized. Mm. Thank so you so th much, Professor. Thank you so much, Professor. It's <laughs> perfect. Uh, uh, it's a perfect link with the uh, second part of this uh, uh, annual uh, day, uh, sector coupling and the energy transition. It, uh, it's absolutely perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention. Uh, it was a dense, interesting, stimulating moment. This is a spirit of CR that we have experienced this morning, exchange requirements, benevolence, and we are convinced that these are the principles that will enable us to overcome all the crisis and build a, a better world. A short break, less than 10 minutes before meeting up with my dear friends from CR to talk about sector coupling and the energy transition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Hello and good afternoon. So I would like to welcome everybody back uh, to our second part uh, of the annual conference. And we had heard a lot about uh, um, COVID-19 and its impact on the energy sector, but also on the chance uh, to, uh, to now um, take the moment uh, and uh, speed up uh, the energy transition. And an important element of the energy transition uh, is energy coupling, uh, so sector coupling, which we will look at now at our second uh, panel, sector coupling and the energy transition. And this one is uh, shared uh, by Vice President Wolfgang Urbancic. Over to you, Wolfgang, please. Thank you, Annegret, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, from We already heard that it's sunny in, in Paris and uh, good afternoon from sunny Vienna. So I hope everywhere uh, uh, in Europe uh, the spring is, is arriving. Uh, now, our topic, as uh, it was already said by Annegret, is about sector coupling and the energy transition. Uh, we will have uh, a presentation of the CR white papers on these issues, uh, and then followed by uh, presentations uh, from very interesting uh, speakers. Before uh, I invite uh, my colleagues from CER, uh, I also have a question for you, and you are invited to uh, also to participate in this uh, whole question. The question is, which of the following seems most important to you in achieving decarbonization beyond simply increasing electrification? And we have uh, several uh, answers prepared for you. A, power to gas, B, green hydrogen, C, biogas, D, greater efficiency, E, storage, F stands for flexibility, or G, other. So you are invited to um, to answer to this uh, question. And uh, in the meanwhile, I can uh, uh, give a brief introduction. Um, our uh, speakers in the following uh, 15 minutes will be Vice President Pedro Vadeo. He is a member of the Board of Directors of uh, the Portuguese regulator. And Pedro is also chairing uh, the GAS working group of uh, CR and also the joint working group with ACER. Same is uh, with uh, Christina Matarazzi Wagner. She is working for the Austrian Regulatory Authority as head of the electricity department, and she is chairing the European, the CER electricity working group, and also the joint uh, working group, the ASA working group for electricity. Uh, she's an electrical engineer, and uh, they both have uh, uh, experience, of course, in regulating uh, the gas and the electricity industry, and therefore. Uh, I'm happy uh, to uh, give the virtual floor to uh, my two colleagues, and they will give a brief presentation of the white papers um, 
uh, relating long-term storage, uh, the regulatory treatment of power to gas, and uh, a paper on when and how to regulate hydro trend networks. These are uh, CR papers and uh, two of them CR and ASA papers. So I, I will hand over the floor to, uh, I think Pedro will start, uh, followed by Christine, uh, and please the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, Wolfgang and uh, Annegret also. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, well, it is uh, with great pleasure that uh, I joined this panel today to discuss uh, uh, sector coupling and uh, the energy transition, as uh, mentioned by Wolfgang. And uh, as mentioned in the beginning by Commissioner Simpson, we are uh, currently facing a moment of major change and transition that requires our utmost attention and action. Uh, this energy transition, characterized by the integration of renewables at large scale into our energy system, is be being prepared for uh, a few, few years now. And uh, in uh, the next slide, I recall uh, the history of our uh, energy markets. We started with the, the uh, three energy packages, establishing some essential rules and uh, roles for the functioning of our energy market, including liberalization, unbundling, building an internal energy market, creating new entities like Acer and Ensos, uh, binding network codes, proving them, and uh, strengthening consumer rights. Uh, indeed, our internal, internal energy markets of electricity and gas in all the time horizons. So we have a, a very complex model that provides signals in all time horizons. And those markets are instrumental to enable the integration of renewables at large scale and at least cost. It is important to acknowledge that we have made collectively an excellent work during these last years. However, we have to keep pushing for the efficiency of the internal energy market and do not give it as, as granted. Markets are indeed a fantastic provider of the needed flexibility to couple with renewables. Uh, then we have the clean energy package in the middle of this slide, which is where we stand now preparing the way for a new market design and uh, new energy systems that facilitate facilitated centralization, consumer participation and more energy efficiency. With a more centralized and friendly commercial layer fitted to small scale distributed energy resources, it will be possible in one end to democratize the access to the generation activity and in the other end to unlock the short and medium term flexibility available in our end user process in the industry at our homes and services buildings. Unlocking our embedded local flexibility will ensure the integration in our energy system a higher levels of renewables at least cost. But to respond to the environmental, social and political challenges, we need to go beyond the innovations in the clean energy package and look from an integrated energy system perspective. This is the direction the European Green Deal, Green Deal has set and we as regulators are committed to contributing to achieving a carbon neutral society. The announcement of this third dimension related to cross-sector integration will enable our society to move to net zero, decarbonizing the intensive CO2 sectors and managing long-term flexibility at least cost. So these uh, three dimensions presented in this slide indeed will uh, contribute to, uh, to this energy transition. 
in order to um, understand how the gas sector will be affected by this overall transformation, we regulators developed in 2019 together with ACER the bridge beyond 2025. The bridge document follows up on our 2018 frog study, study on the future role of gas and addresses a range of issues including the functioning of the market, the emergency of new entities and actors, developing dynamic regulation that is fit for the future and the possible implications on transmission tariffs. Based on this high-level analysis, we have further developed our reflections in a series of white papers that were recently published and which are important for promoting sector coupling, namely on hydrogen, power to gas and long-term storage. And uh, moving to uh, the first white paper on uh, hydrogen, uh, here you can see the main messages and uh, the first one is that hydrogen is considered a key priority to achieve the European Green Deal and the Europe's clean energy transition, which raises some concerns in terms of the need to regulate its infrastructure. In this regard, we certainly have to ensure a dynamic and gradual regulatory approach to ensure the proper regulation, but also the proper development of this technology. Clarity is important for potential investors and therefore we call for the application of general market and regulation principles already applicable in the European energy sector legislation. And also it is important to recall that this technology is still at an early stage and we must allow it to evolve and emerge with as much clarity as possible to contribute to the proper development of this new infrastructure. Temporary exemptions to new rules may be also applicable, for example, for existing and new hydrogen infrastructure like business to business uh, networks. So we, we address that in our paper. And thinking ahead, we also have to consider that in the future gas assets, some of them could be repurposed for hydrogen and uh, this will certainly have to be considered based on an improved cost-benefit analysis. And when doing so, we must follow the principle, principle of cost reflectivity to avoid cross-subsidies between users of the various uh, competing networks in the future. In the uh, next slide, we see that we have also tackled power to gas in light of sector coupling solutions. The future development of these technologies raises various questions in terms of their regulatory treatment. Regulators support, of course, a technology neutral approach, but it is important to revisit the current set of definitions with respect to the use of the networks properly including all activities in the gas and electricity sectors to make sure we are all speaking the same language. As regulators, we also believe that the investment and management of power to gas facilities should be market-based and open to competition among market players. And therefore, TSOs and DSOs should only be allowed to invest in this installation in exceptional circumstances will suit naturally power to gas facilities need to be included in holistic analysis of integrated energy systems and planning. Finally, as you would expect on an economic regulator, uh, uh, we of course consider that network tariffs should not be used to subsidize technologies but they can provide a level playing field for comparable activities in the context of an integrated energy system. Policymakers must also be careful to avoid the destructive effects of taxes and levies as we try to converge 
towards a, an integrated uh, system. As a final note, I would like to welcome the European Commission's initiatives in light of the European Green Deal and hope that our white papers can contribute to the further development of future energy policies. And we see in CR, we are committed to continuing and con our contribution towards decarbonization. And uh, now uh, I will uh, hand over the presentation to my colleague Christina to present the third topic in uh, this series of white papers on long-term storage. Uh, Christina shares the, the latest working group on electricity. Thank you very much for, for, for this op opportunity. Thank you, Pedro. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to present uh, the third uh, white paper, namely the one on long-term storage. Allow me to start uh, mentioning that system integration, uh, integration of the different energy vectors uh, around the decarbonization uh, has by far more than one dimension. So we're talking about additional electrification of areas, about smart grids and digitalization, also about, as Pedro just did, uh, about hydrogen networks and markets and the conditions for that. And of course, we're talking about renewables integration, a high share of renewables and a key element or key dimension is storage. And as regulators, we are, of course, interested to optimize the interlinkages between the different energy vectors uh, to come out uh, with solutions at least cost and for the benefit of, of the consumers and the market participants. So I'm coming to the next slide. I'm not sure if that worked with my remote, but I try it again. Yeah. Uh, so in fact, there are more than just long-term storage if you want to shift energy within the year. So the seasonality that needs to be covered with a higher amount of volatility in the system. It could also be interconnectors, uh, but they are mainly or significantly higher used uh, in the short term. There could also be an excess of renewables. So install so many capacities that you always have enough uh, generation from renewables is might not be very efficient, as well as the next option, which would be the curtailment. Um, even in times where in periods where you have enough wind and enough sun, uh, curtailment might also be not the, the best solution, which leads to uh, the demand side. Uh, this is, of course, is a, a crucial issue on the customer side, but as well covering power to gas or even power to X. And finally, long-term storage uh, on the hydro side, so pumped hydro storage, and on the gas side. And you can see in the diagram in the middle what we tried to analyze. And it was, uh, we tried to, to glimpse into the future, uh, into the year 2040 with 100% renewables in Europe. Uh, you see in the diagram the seasonalities of the wind generation and the solar generation, uh, not so much for hydro, but as well the seasonality in the demand. And surprisingly, uh, the storage need, so the need to shift energy within the year is not so huge. It's around 75 to 94 terawatt hours. But, uh, and you see that on the right side of the slide, uh, at the bottom you see that for pumped hydro storage, uh, the installed capacity is around 14 terawatt hours. And the uh, technological potential is a bit more than 50. But luckily, in the other sector, namely gas, we have an average annual need for storage that is 740 uh, terawatt hours, and the already now installed volumes uh, cover more than 1,000 terawatt hours. So, on the next slide, it's uh, you, you see that uh, I listed five points why sector coupling could provide here for efficient solutions. Well, firstly, uh, the only two mature technologies for this huge um, energy shift over the year are pumped hydro storage and gas storage. And uh, as I just mentioned on the slide before, uh, even the uh, technological potential for additional pumped hydro storage is um, not so big. But if you think about economic potential, this is even lower. But on the gas side, there's enough space to cover not only the needs stemming from the gas side, but also the needs stemming from the electricity side. But we identified until 2040 no significant additional demand for long-term storage. So 
uh, we still see in the years to come a phase out of uh, gas and other fossil fuels, a phase out even of nuclear. And so uh, it might need a really high share of renewables in the whole system that is long term storage uh, will be beneficial. And of course, the ratio between photovoltaics so solar uh, and wind is crucial to cope with the different seasonalities of both types of generation. And to the next slide, please. Requirements that we see for long term storage are first a very high level of integration of renewables, so a high share of wind and solar um, in the system. And this shift over the year needs, of course, large storage capacities related to a low cost per megawatt hour. And all this should be based on a technolo technology uh, neutral needs assessment. So we have two quite strong cornerstones that we see from the regulatory side. Uh, one is that um, a, a level playing field needs to be established between all seasonal adequacy options. So not only long term storage, but the ones I mentioned on my first slide. And a uh, second point is that for sector coupling and um, also the whole area of, of, of storage, it would be fantastic to in more detail integrate this in the European network planning procedures. And with that, I'm at the end of my presentation. Uh, I thank you for your interest and I hand back to Wolfgang. Thank you so much, Christine and uh, Pedro, for this presentation. As it was said, we see our working papers as, uh, and white papers as contribution to uh, uh, this process uh, and to the discussions for a decarbonized uh, future. Coming back and talking about the decarbonization, um, I, we asked the question, which of the following seems most important to you in achieving decarbonization beyond simply increasing electrification? And uh, now I can see, um, you can see also the answers and uh, efficiency, greater efficiency is uh, the number one answer, followed by flexibility, by green hydrogen and by storage. Of course, uh, what we can see is, of course, uh, that uh, storage could be also uh, a part of flexibility, uh, but very interesting answers. Uh, this means uh, energy efficiency is really important, but uh, then of course, efficiency, uh, but also hydrogen. And we come back to hydrogen later on. Now, uh, I would like to um, continue now with the presentations uh, uh, from our speakers uh, in this panel. Uh, as you can see, unfortunately, Katarina sikov mani uh, cannot uh, attend uh, this meeting, but um, talking about flexibility, uh, we are happy uh, to uh, welcome Miklos uh, Gaspa. He is uh, working in DG Anna in the directorate uh, of uh, Katarina. He's team leader of the infrastructure unit and he's so flexible that he uh, stepped in and he will give us uh, an introduction and, uh, uh, and his view uh, on these topics. Uh, so uh, uh, Miklos, uh, thank you very much and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, welcoming words and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, so, um, uh, well, as you know, uh, the Commission uh, published uh, the climate target plan back in September 2020, last year, and this serves very much as a, as a basis for the public debate on increasing the EU's contribution to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and prepare, uh, uh, and it prepares the ground for upcoming legislative proposals and initiative to come in the course of this year. The uh, Commission's impact assessment, which underpins this uh, climate target plan, builds um, on um, on achievements of currently agreed 2030 targets, and uh, and it shows that achieving an increased emission reduction target of at least 55% is doable, but. It is something that will require actions in all sectors. Um, one key element to decarbonize in a cost effective way is, um, is certainly uh, energy system integration, which is uh, today's topic. Um, the Commission uh, put forward an energy system integration uh, 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 as, uh, 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 as a central element of its energy policy, and it adopted a strategy last summer uh, along with a strategy on hydrogen, 
um, uh, building on three complementary pillars uh, uh, to define uh, what sector integration uh, uh, should uh, uh, in particular mean in the energy sector. So first, it is about creating a more circular economy with putting the energy efficiency first principle at the core. Uh, too much energy or potential energy is wasted in our current system from heat and gases that are released into the atmosphere to byproducts of industrial processes and energy production. And this could be captured and used for other purposes. The second pillar is uh, an accelerated pace of electrification um, uh, uh, of end use sectors based on a largely renewables based uh, 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 power system. To meet our uh, emission reductions goals in the power sector, we need much more electricity to be generated from renewables and uh, 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 put to use in areas such as buildings, industry and transport. Thirdly, the promotion of renewable and low carbon fuels, including hydrogen, um, uh, for hard to decarbonize sectors, because some sectors like in particular heavy transport or industry are harder to identify uh, uh, to, uh, to electrify directly. So um, Europe needs to invest in cleaner fuels to uh, provide uh, uh, green energy to these, uh, uh, to these end uses. An integrated energy system will also rely on well-functioning energy markets, better infrastructure planning, and progress of digitalization in the, in the energy sector. All of this is clearly a big challenge also for the national regulatory authorities. It requires namely a coordinated planning and coordinated operation of the energy system as a whole across multiple energy carriers, across multiple infrastructures and consumption sectors. And this is quite a fundamental shift away from the separate regulation of each energy carrier. In an integrated system, Efficient markets should guide consumers towards the most energy efficient and cheapest decarbonization option on the basis of prices that properly reflect all the costs of the energy carrier used across all of the energy carriers. Um, energy system integration will translate into more physical links between those energy carriers. And this calls for a new holistic approach for both large scale and local infrastructure planning, including the protection and resilience of critical infrastructures. The NRAs will have to provide a framework to make the most of the existing energy infrastructure while avoiding both lock-in effects and stranded assets. Infrastructure planning in the future should facilitate the integration of various energy carriers and arbitrate between the de development of new infrastructure or the repurposing of existing infrastructure. It should the planning should also consider alternatives to network-based options, especially demand-side solutions and storage, which we also mentioned in the previous uh, uh, presentation. So the life of NRAs will for sure be quite exciting over the next decade. Now, what are the plans of the European Commission under the FIT for 55% package? The Commission is preparing detailed legislative proposals on how to achieve the 55% target. Now, part of this package will be importantly, the revision of the energy efficiency directive and the revision of the renewable energy directive. As regards system integration, these initiatives will complement already adopted initiatives, in particular, the revision of the 10E regulation, which governs the selection and support uh, uh, framework for, uh, for projects of common interest. Uh, in the field of energy. And finally, a few words on the decarbonization of the gas sector. Because as mentioned previously, in many areas, electrification, direct electrification, uh, uh, will be the viable way forward. However, gaseous fuels will remain present in the EU's energy system uh, uh, also uh, in the long term, so towards 2050. Um, they will represent around 20% of the overall energy mix according to the climate target impact assessment. While currently this energy of course comes uh, to a very large extent uh, uh, predominantly uh, even from uh, uh, natural gas or from fossil uh, uh, methane, in the future uh, renewable and low carbon alternatives 
such as in particular biomethane, biogas and renewable hydrogen, will need to represent um, the lion's share of this because the unabated use of natural gas will become increasingly incompatible with the carbon neutrality objective for mid-century. So against this background, the Commission will prepare a decarbonization uh, package on gas uh, with the objective to make the gas market fit for this transition. We have recently launched a public consultation on this and um, uh, aim for a proposal by the end of the year. So I thank you for your attention and um, this is what I have to say. Thank you very much, Miklos. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, the views of the Commission with us and uh, uh, the plans of the European Commission. And uh, we are happy to uh, to keep in touch with the Commission and to have uh, uh, interesting uh, discussions about um, um, these uh, future plans. Um, uh, before we, I, I think at, at the end of our session, we can have uh, uh, some questions. We already arrived some questions, but um, I would suggest to continue with the presentations before at the end, uh, we will have the questions. Now, um, uh, the next speaker is Uros uh, Salovia. Uros is uh, working for the Slovenian TSO. Uh, and Uros is uh, the general coordinator for system development. He's an advisor to the CEO and he is uh, uh, coordinating large projects. Uh, and we are very much interested in, in your projects and in your presentation. Uros, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Wolfgang. So, Kind regards from Ljubljana, the city of Acer, uh, where where we also observe the, the 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 sunny weather outside. So just to confirm uh, that we are in line with uh, other cities in Europe today, and um, I will I will talk actually very much about uh, inno innovative projects going in direction of um, cross sector coupling, and I can really not uh, say it better than Miklos about what uh, the, the sector coupling means for, for a business entity like a TSO. Uh, it goes beyond the interfaces. It goes beyond the flexibility uh, from one energy carrier to the other. It also goes beyond the integrated market. Actually, it goes into the planning, into this arbitrage of investments uh, taking place in, in different uh, energy carrier sectors. Uh, it goes into the direction of, of solving the storage uh, issues. It is uh, usually area specific, locational specific. Uh, it also deals with how we are going to manage the transport. It goes, of course, from power to, to heat uh, into, into clean gases and all these fields. So um, the next uh, question, the big question is, of course, why, why is this uh, uh, sector coupling so important? Urosh, we just, uh, at least I can't hear you. Do you hear me now? Sorry. Yes. Uh, I will have to ask for the next slide because it seems that the clicker doesn't work. Yeah, one more. So if we look to the, from the current perspective, uh, it is quite uh, normal and observable that um, the price uh, of, of infrastructure in the, in the following years will, will, will increase. So, so the energy prices related to the new investment, if we go to the next slide, so next week, yeah. So in, the, in this formation phase of, of the energy system, which will be able to uh, sustain all these uh, renewable energy sources, we will have to have some investment which will cause uh, energy increase. But the most important part where we see that, that the cross-sector coupling can really make benefits is the, is the slide showing the next picture, if you can click one. So if we do it right, then the energy price in the long-term future will come back to the existing levels. And this is what we want to achieve. And if the wrong investment will take place, if we will not uh, do the holistic approach and, and include the planning aspects into our work, then we might not end up where, where we started right now. Now, the, the, the important question, of course, is how to do it, how, how to make this future to happen. Uh, can we go to the next slide? One more. 
Yes. So the first thing which we feel is the most important to start with is that the business will have to upgrade on new roles. Uh, we will have to break some of the existing barriers because we are today very sector specific. We are focused into sectors and we will have to go out of this business comfort zone, look into the other uh, sectors. And of course, the regulatory framework must support the activities of the business entities to go across. If we go to the next slide, um, the, the first step which we have to do in, in direction of action is to get the credible answers to the question uh, which will be raised. For this reason, we will actually need to go for cross-sector digital twins. We have to develop these tools in able to be able to answer to the most tough questions. Um, and, and this is really in opposition to do a guessing and to uh, avoid uh, getting a detailed answers on locational specific questions and uh, area sector specific questions. So we have to get across the sector. There will be an enormous need for artificial intelligence and for other techniques used in this uh, new simulated environment which we have to build. But uh, if I just move one more step forward. Next slide, please. Uh, what we as a business entity see as the most important here is that um, the future projects, investment projects, which will take place, um, are going actually in partnership across the sectors. So the cross-sector partnership should not be focused only on innovation, should not be focused only on the, the analysis, but should actually end up with investment projects. This is so important if we want to drive the current state from A to B. This is so important if we want to engage between utilities, if we want to engage market actors with public utilities, and it's also important if you want to move things between the utilities and the end users. So um, if I may wrap up uh, my presentation at this point, uh, going from the uh, electricity prices of today through the increase back to the normal of, of what we expect, what also the customers expect, will require from us enormous uh, work to be done on the cross-sector level and uh, bringing these utilities and uh, the, the end consumers, market and non-market actors together through the partnership on investment level is really the key for the future uh, as we imagine it could play out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uros. That was really a very interesting presentation. Um, uh, food for thought, uh, uh, very inspiring. Uh, and uh, we'll come back to you, of course, uh, in our discussion. Thank you. Now, our third speaker today is Jorgo Katsimakakis. Uh, Jorgo is Secretary General of Hydrogen Europe. Uh, but Jorgo uh, was also a member of the European Parliament, uh, I understand, from 2004 to 2014. So in this period, for instance, uh, there was also the adoption of the third energy package. And uh, you were also a member of the ITRE committee, which means you are familiar with all these uh, questions. Um, uh, so we are really uh, very interested in, in your views, uh, especially when it comes uh, to the role of hydrogen in our future energy world. So please, your Many thanks, Wolfgang. And uh, to complement this, I was even the rapporteur on ACER. Uh, and on Remit in the European Parliament. So uh, uh, I'm extremely pleased to see that uh, uh, our baby Acer from that time is now still hosted in Ljubljana. And uh, I will pick it up from Salo Bir, who was absolutely to the point when it comes to in the investments. And uh, I, of course, uh, would like to uh, explain how these investments can happen, uh, what is the precondition, the basis for these investments. Uh, so it fits uh, exactly uh, uh, as a follow-up presentation to what Salobir said. Um, 
We will, as Hydrogen Europe, present at the big conference of the EU presidency, the Portuguese presidency, uh, 7th of April in Lisbon, but it will be a virtual meeting, a paper which is called the Hydrogen Act. Uh, and I would like to uh, explain that uh, in this uh, Hydrogen Act, there are nine principles. Yeah, it works. Um, and um, I, these principles are basically the basis for this market development. And let me drive you through these principles. Um, number one, hydrogen has become systemic. Uh, it's not the innovative niche anymore. So due to both elements, the hydrogen strategy of the European Union and the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance that have been initiated 8th of July, uh, it's a central part of the European Green Deal uh, and many, many people describe hydrogen development as the other leg of the energy transition. You could also say mobility and industry transition and um, uh, electricity will now be backed up. The second principle, hydrogen has a key role in delivering climate neutrality. Uh, so it merits a dedicated framework. I think this is important um, that uh, uh, it's not only power to gas sector coupling, it's a third element next to the gas grid and the power grid that might occur, that might come up, and we, of course, support this. Uh, then it is very important, that's the third principle, to have a clear definition on clean hydrogen. What is clean hydrogen? Uh, so it needs to be climate law compliant. The carbon content, of course, will be the major uh, issue, uh, we call carbon content the new currency. It should be a science-based definition. There should be clear life cycle uh, analysis methodologies and thresholds, uh, the ground for it, the basis for it. We are looking forward to the taxonomy uh, definition on the cleanliness of hydrogen, which is expected for 24th of April. The fourth principle is that this hydrogen act that we will propose there uh, focuses on infrastructure on one hand, so better and clearer and more transparent regulation on infrastructure, but also some market aspects. It describes three phases of the development. A kickstart, which is from 22 to 25, um, then a ramp up and a market growth that comes later. Let me just focus on the kickstart 22 to 25. This is the period where the engineering process that takes place now this year, we will present 18th of May, the first project pipeline. So the first projects that will be um, um, implemented next year. Um, this is the year of uh, engineering, also financial engineering. Next year will uh, be the year for three years of big demonstrators and pilots to bring hydrogen prices down. The sixth uh, principle is that uh, in order to meet the 24 and 30 targets, the kickstart phase will require exceptions and derogations from existing EU rules, especially when it comes to state aid. It will be a time, and we are quite um, um, in good conversation with uh, DG Competition, that uh, for this time, uh, relaxation and waivers of state aid rules will happen. It's important because of the disruptive character and the cost that will occur. Seventh principle, different tools can be utilized to incentivize market uptake and functioning on the production side and on the demand side. We know about feed-in tariffs, we know about quota, but there are some new elements like the carbon contract for difference uh, and auctioning systems uh, that might help on the demand side to bring down the cost. The eighth principle um, is, I will come back to this uh, clear certification scheme, um, and uh, I don't elaborate now, I come back in a minute. And the Hydrogen Act should contribute to framing hydrogen, hydrogen replacement strategy. So uh, it can replace, hydrogen can replace oil, coal, gas, uh, and also grey hydrogen. Now I need to click, just a second. Yep, does it work? It does. Can you click to the next slide, please? The clicker does not accept it. No, um, I, we are quite happy. <clears throat> Sorry, we are quite happy to see that uh, Acer and also Sear did pick up the ideas uh, of two distinct 
um, approaches with regards to blending uh, and, um, and pure hydrogen networks. This is important. And uh, we also believe, I'm not, um, you know yourself best, uh, your recommendations there. Um, I'm just commenting on the right hand side uh, on how we see it. So we see that the 10E regulation already foresees separate hydrogen networks, and we fully welcome this. Uh, the, develop, the development of the hydrogen market will not develop in the same way as the gas market did. Unbundling models may not, strictly speaking, be the same as in the gas market, and there might be also transition periods. Market tests to assess the different situations across Europe need to happen. We are, as Hydrogen Europe, in a close alignment uh, between ACER uh, and the recommendations that we see made by you, but also the input that uh, the trinomics study uh, on hydrogen reg regulations uh, will come up with. And there should be a clear distinction in the approach to blending uh, of hydrogen and pure hydrogen. We regard this as, as a very important. And once you go then for uh, the pure hydrogen markets, uh, yeah, then we would like to present the five T's. You need a guarantee of origin system that um, takes the threshold that will, will be <clears throat> published in a few weeks as a clear rule. And then this pure hydrogen certification scheme should mm, be traceable, trackable, transparent, tradable, and trustworthy. Uh, and we think that um, let second ledger technologies like blockchain could help. The maturity of this technology is not there yet. But uh, we are absolutely uh, sure that uh, we can build this up, including also importation schemes, as Europe will, and we should not kid ourselves, will be an importing, uh, importing entity when it comes to hydrogen. I would like to thank you here for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jorgo, um, for this presentation. Now, um, there is one question, which is, uh, I think, a very good question for all uh, uh, of you. Um, uh, since uh, you mentioned it, uh, for instance, Uros mentioned it when he was talking about uh, building up new roles and responsibilities. And Jorgo also mentioned uh, uh, the question of unbundling and uh, the, the, the future role of unbundling, uh, which uh, will might not fit uh, for uh, hydrogen. Uh, the unbinding rules for gas. Uh, and this is my question, or this is the question. Um, do you think um, what is going to be the, the, the future role of, especially of the TSOs or of other market participants when it comes to hydrogen? This is a question to a representative of a TSO, um, to Uros, as well as to Jorgo, of course, uh, but also uh, maybe uh, Miklos, uh, since he mentioned the decarbonization uh, package now uh, the, the, the the former gas package uh, because we know in the electricity directive we have special rules already for TSOs but not in the gas directive yet and uh, the question will be um, what do you think of the future role of especially of the TSOs uh, maybe Uros you want to start yep. uh, I'm, am I still hear me yes please go ahead thank you yeah so um, uh, I really have so many partners currently running on. I think we are, as a, as a TSO, we are in like 25 partnerships in different areas, all about cross-sector issues. And uh, from the experience, I can tell you that, um, of course, TSO should never interfere into activities which are related to markets. Yeah. So we cannot build assets which could disturb the market operation uh, uh, as a per se. But uh, but maybe what what is needed here and the roles which I was talking about um, are critical in one single point which I really uh, have to stress here the coordination. Not many business enterprises are willing or are even able to take over the responsibility to create to initiate huge partnerships where many business enterprises are included for cross-sector uh, projects and which are then driven for the benefits of all different players. 
And, and this role is really critical here. We see it also for Horizon 2020 projects that not many big companies are taking over this role of coordination. Sometimes the institutes and, and, and technology companies are, are taking the lead. But here really lies the, the key element. So who will coordinate these projects of the future, investments of the future? And if, if these coordinators can come from the TSO uh, environments, I think they can somehow serve this neutrality principle. They will not interfere the markets, but still uh, offer the best, I think, coordination and balancing of the powers to all the entities. But it might also be a different model, but this is something what we find as a very important element of discussion. Thank you. Yara. Yeah, um, first of all, I agree uh, fully with Salobir, but um, also I would like to uh, make an additional point. If we look at the at the German uh, electricity market that uh, last year had for the first time more renewable than fossil elements, 45% renewable, that's great. Uh, that's a big achievement. The downside of it is that the balancing cost, so the prior, prioritization of, of uh, green uh, electricity plus curtailment, all together have uh, summed up to cost of 32 billion. That's quite a lot. And that is why um, we need to think about efficiency, which was uh, very, very high in the ranking of uh, your answers uh, previously. Um, we need to think of efficiency a little bit more broader. Cost efficiency also plays a role. Why am I saying that? Because in the future, the balancing of grids and the balancing between uh, electricity TSOs and gas TSOs will play a, a, a massive role. And here, this is the role of TSOs to build up the, the power to gas gates that help to bring down the cost, that help to integrate more renewable energy into the system. So building up a pure hydrogen network or a backbone is number one and key role of the TSOs. And here, of course, they are exactly what Salove said, the coordinators of that process. If in that process, they sometimes will be uh, owners of power to gas installations that will be decided, of course, by the policy makers. But as long as there is no private um, uh, support for that, TSOs should become, uh, should be put in the position uh, to do that. Later on, um, if there is a, a private, uh, a market oriented um, supply of power to gas, they will uh, go back and become the gatekeepers of the cleanliness of hydrogen. So in these pure networks, they need to make sure that the hydrogen has uh, indeed a clean character according to the threshold and to the guarantees of origin. And I think that's a very important role for the longer run. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Miklos, do you want to uh, add something uh, relating to the decarbonization package or... Yes, perhaps just a few words. I mean, um, uh, uh, the Commission, as I as I mentioned uh, quite briefly uh, uh, in the in the introduction, we uh, uh, the Commission is now working on on uh, on this package. A public consultation has been launched, and uh, well, basically uh, uh, the the main policy objective, uh, the focus of this initiative will be to facilitate the uptake of renewable and low carbon gases in the gas market and uh, uh, the development of, uh, uh, of an EU hydrogen market. Um, it, it will also address uh, uh, methane emissions. And there are, of course, I mean, this is, this is a big topic. And, there, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, if you go through the, through the public consultation, there is a number of issues which are uh, specifically mentioned here. Uh, uh, I mean, hydrogen infrastructure, what role it will play, uh, 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 how it will be deployed, uh, uh, what kind of intervention uh, 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 in terms of regulation uh, makes sense. Um, level playing field uh, for renewable and low carbon gases um, uh, by improving uh, uh, their tradability and by ensuring that they have access to existing gas infrastructure. Um, uh, 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 gas quality issues which may, uh, uh, which may arise when you start injecting in the uh, uh, in the gas network, uh, increasing shares of biomethane and hydrogen uh, 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 aspects on how to achieve a more integrated uh, approach, which takes into account uh, 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 both the needs 
gas and electricity and the future possibly the future hydrogen systems and and consumer rights i mean so it is it is really Uh, initiative, uh, uh, which uh, uh, for the time being is in the in the public consultation page, and I, I encourage everybody then to uh, to uh, uh, to uh, read this document and contribute to this process because uh, 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 the stakeholder input will uh, will be um, uh, essential in 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 shaping the uh, the outcome of of uh, of the of the commission initiative, which is expected. Uh, uh, towards the uh, okay. Thank you, Miklos. Um, have uh, uh, Urosh wants to step in, please, Urosh. Yeah, I, I just wanted to to extend the discussion also in direction of power to heat and transportation because these two sectors also will need a lot of optimization investments. So if we want to build the transport network which will be supplied with, fu with future alternative fuels, we will also need a lot of co-optimization of, of infrastructure investments. And the same will go for power to heat. There are member states where on the household levels, 80% of energy consumption is related to the heat. So you can imagine what would it mean if all this heat ends up in electricity system and how enormous these investments would be in the electricity system if we don't do this transformation in the right way. So power to heat, power to gas, uh, but in, in the in the way of, of cross-sector coupling, not only in the in the way of interfaces, is really the key, including the, the transportation sector investment as well. Okay, now uh, we have uh, Jorgo, uh, and then uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, but there is uh, also a question uh, related to the CR paper. This is how, why I would like at the end come back to uh, to Pedro. Um, but uh, before that, uh, please, your many thanks, and Uros. Sorry for mixing up your first name with the last name. So, no problem. No problem at all. Very interesting discussion. Um, my my point here is that there is one principle. Um, which is called the additionality principle, which is, uh, so to say, a, a proposal in the RED2 directive, uh, Renewable Energy Directive, which would really do harm to, uh, to this um, idea of letting hydrogen help uh, the balancing of the grids. The additionality principle foresees that only additional uh, uh, renewable installations may be used for hydrogen production, so basically it says you can do whatever you want with green electricity unless one thing you cannot do hydrogen now. And that, of course, would, if it stays like this, be a major bottleneck for investments. Um, there are possibilities to keep the additionality principle, but to phase only in as of 25, that would be acceptable. But uh, to keep it as it is now um, would be a major bottleneck. Uh, that's a clear uh, request of uh, our members of the industry that wants to invest in into that new technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Edo, um, there is one question uh, relating to, to uh, the white paper uh, and the question whether in the white paper uh, the, uh, uh, the, the regulation uh, should be integrated into gas or separate regulation when it comes to hydrogen. Uh, maybe you could also uh, give us an answer to this question to the audience. Thank you. Pedro, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you very much, Wolfgang, for helping me solving that uh, problem. Uh, yes, the, the, the question is very interesting. We have to uh, our white papers and the proposals that we have uh, uh, in there, well, they are um, they are uh, well adapted in in my opinion and our opinion to the uh, uncertainty regarding the future, to the fast technology development that is moving faster than the modification of our uh, regulatory framework. And so we uh, propose uh, regarding, for instance, the regulation of hydrogen networks to uh, adopt 
uh, a dynamic regulation approach to assess how is the uh, third party, third party uh, access to to that infrastructures that may may emerge uh, is uh, um, is in is working, and uh, then define also some criteria, some trigger that uh, uh, should be uh, analyzed in order to uh, in, so that regulation kick in and uh, and uh, what we are talking about in that case so and we, we consider that uh, uh, we have to of course uh, ensure uh, a legal framework that is uh, that that is uh, technology technology neutral because flexibility providers are mainly uh, market actors that will be uh, 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 that will provide those service through price signals uh, defining in, in in the market and here we are talking about uh, the existent markets that we have in all the frameworks because due to that i call the importance of the of the internal energy market in all the uh, term references uh, short term to medium and long term and uh, well those uh, uh, those new technologies, all of them, will be uh, integrated in those uh, in those markets, and uh, and hydrogen is one of them, and power to gas also. So what we uh, should, uh, what we uh, propose it to is to have a, a, a technological neutral approach, oriented by the market, and uh, uh, through more complex uh, uh, methodologies regarding the planning and also regarding the operation, the, the dispatch of these new technologies. And our papers are in a way illuminated or oriented by these uh, uh, major principles. Thank you so much, Pedro. Um, uh, thank you. Um, thanks to all the panelists. Um, unfortunately, uh, we ha I have to close uh, this session. Um, I think the discussion shows that it's really important to uh, to come together uh, to uh, to discuss all these topics, and we as CR are, are more than happy to uh, to discuss this and to have an exchange of view with uh, all the stakeholders. Um, by this, I want to thank you again, and uh, um, I will uh, close now this panel, and I will hand over to our president Annegret Gruber. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for all the interesting contributions here and the interesting discussions. And uh, uh, before I um, pull together and wrap up, I would like to briefly present the draft CR Energy Transition Strategy, uh, which is now up for consultation. So maybe we can go to the next slide. And uh, I think a lot of the different um, the different uh, elements of this strategy have been touched upon uh, today already, um, and uh, the important uh, di regulatory dimensions that we have. And uh, maybe the slide pull pops up. Uh, I'll start uh, presenting. Was just mentioned also by Petro again the enormous importance of well-functioning markets on the national level, but also the internal energy market uh, at the European level, uh, based uh, on the uh, principles uh, that have shown the resilience uh, in uh, during the, the pandemic uh, and also during uh, all the, the pr time that we have. And uh, we think that here it is important that those uh, markets uh, develop uh, and um, uh, provide uh, the flexibility that we uh, that we see uh, that we need. Uh, sorry, that we need uh, to cope uh, with uh, the new uh, and uh, more volatile renewable uh, sources, uh, and also to ensure the uh, system integration. However, we should not forget that at the center of all the activities of uh, the regulation and uh, of the legislature, 
uh, we place the, uh, the consumer. So what we aim at is a consumer-centric dynamic regulation. And we have used and heard already the word dynamic regulation. And indeed, there, was, there were a lot of good uh, development or good definitions mentioned uh, today. Uh, one is also the adaptation uh, to the changing uh, and evolving uh, conditions. I think that was mentioned by Mechthild also. Uh, and that is, uh, we, that is what we put in uh, also uh, in our strategy. Uh, and as I said, the most important, however, is to focus and to target this uh, to the, towards the consumer, to put the consumer at the center. And what we have done in our strategy is indeed uh, to integrate uh, the Vision 2030 that we have developed uh, last year together with uh, BOIC uh, in, into our strategy. We have always put the consumer in the center of our activities. That is the, the task of the regulator. And now we have also integrated this into and put it at the core of our strategy. Uh, this document uh, here uh, is on our website, of course, and here's the link also with the questionnaire. And uh, as I said, we are more than happy to uh, invite you uh, to uh, contrib uh, contribute and to participate in this uh, public consultation. Now, before um, I uh, come to an end of this uh, CR uh, conference, I will check again whether our president, uh, Annegret Kröbel, is uh, found her way back to this conference, to this uh, virtual meeting, uh, but unfortunately, this is not the case. Uh, uh, which means uh, for me and for all my colleagues who are uh, working in CR, uh, working uh, also at the National Regulatory Authority, I would like to thank you so much. Uh, more than 500 participants today, uh, that's really, uh, that's really, great for us. Uh, that means uh, uh, you are interested in this topic, you are interested also in this exchange of views, and we as CR are, uh, of course, also in future available for you for further elaborations and discussions. And uh, seeing this, I would like uh, to thank again all the panelists, uh, all the speakers today uh, for their interesting contributions, and uh, I would like to uh, conclude this uh, uh, this conference. Thank you very much for joining. Goodbye.